Hi, everybody. Hello, happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna just um, give folks a moment to get settled, get comfortable, and then we'll get right into the program. Um, on your screen, there are just a couple of tips and tricks for Zoom. We are gonna be um, playing a couple of songs here today. So the stronger your internet, the better your connectivity. Um, if for any reason you have any technical issues along the way, you can feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, enter that, and those of us who are monitoring on the back end will make sure to take care of you. Um, also, if you have questions along the way uh, for Janine, feel free to enter them at any time. We'll be collecting them during the, um, the hour together and then towards the end of the session around um, 445 or so, we'll take a couple of questions and um, get you guys all out of here by five o'clock Eastern time. Um, please set your audio controls to about a medium so you have a little bit of room to go up or down when we um, play clips. And um, other than that, just thank you so much for spending your, your Friday afternoon with us. We're so grateful to be in community with you and um, really excited that Janine has graciously lent her time and talents. And Neil, I'll let you take it from here. Great, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Neil Pepe. I'm the Artistic Director of the Atlantic Theatre Company. Welcome. We're thrilled to have you here on this Friday with Live with the Atlantic and to have the extraordinary Janine Tesori with us. Um, before I jump in, I just wanted to again say thank you for tuning in. Um, we've been, uh, while we're sort of waiting to get back in these strange times to live performance, we've been trying to do these virtual um, offerings, which we're doing for free. And if you're enjoying them and you feel the uh, desire to make a small donation, we'd always appreciate that. I think Claire or somebody can tell you at the end, there's a little button to push if you feel you so desire to do that. But we're just thrilled to be able to have these offerings for you and for you to stay connected to the Atlantic. We're very, very excited to get back into production whenever we can, and we'll stay tuned on that. Um, I'm so thrilled and honored to have Janine Tesori here with us. Thank you so much, Janine, for, for being with us. I, I, I guess the only thing I'll say, which is, I'll, I believe this is true, she's one of the most prolific and honored female theatrical composers in history. She had with five Broadway musicals and five Tony Award nominations. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now, because we're going to get into a lot of her work. But welcome, Janine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure. The first thing I, I wanted to just say or ask you briefly, talk a little bit about how you got into composing, because in, in sort of knowing you a little bit and then reading up, did you, were you originally going to be a doctor? Is that true? Yes, I, I do now. I do surgery as a hobby. So um, <laughs> how, did you, how did you start composing? Uh, you know, I started playing the piano at three and um, my, I came from a very musical family. It skipped my parents, but my, my mother's father was a composer in Italy and he came here and wasn't able to pursue that dream when he had a family. And I just started playing the piano when I was three and I played Edelweiss, I think 89 times before my mother said, give her lessons or give her some different sheet music. I cannot hear it. And, you know, I think that that's why I always tell people it, when you have things like a piano uh, a, around that someone, especially a, a piano, because it's a percussive un instrument, you can just play it, you do. And if you're drawn to it, um, you hear that from a lot of musicians. I tried this instrument and I didn't connect. I tried this instrument and I did. Then you want to play it. And that, um, for me, I started uh, piano lessons when I was six, um, you know, really formally. Um, and I, I used to have a pedal that was an attachment to the pedal because my feet couldn't reach. <laughs> I still have it. And then, so you, so you went off on this other path and then you found your way back to music, how, in college? Well, um, you know, I, um, I, I was classically trained and, and I, was, I was trained as a pop musician. And uh, when I was, um, uh, I got into a serious program and I lost myself completely. Um, 
because it, I didn't understand that the piano was a means to another end. I thought that if you were a, a girl in music and thank God for Karen Carpenter and for Carol King and for all these incredible women I saw as a, as a young girl, especially Karen Carpenter because she was behind the drums and she had bangs and I loved her. And, and so there was, I, I didn't understand what you could do. I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought you had to be a player. And so I, um, I, I had a, a teacher that I loved. And then when I started getting serious, I had more serious teachers. And for me, it was a disaster because that wasn't, the piano was a means to an end. So um, we had a real square off when I was 14 and we had a fight and I quit music. I thought I'll show them. And I did, and I didn't play anything for four years. I went to Barnard and um, I was pre-med there. And a, and a year through, I really, I, I thought, what am I doing? This is not who I am. I don't look good in white. I can't wear a lab coat. So I, I, I just really um, decided to go back to music. I switched to the music major. I did it all at Columbia because the Barnard program wasn't really what I needed. And the Columbia program was incredible for me. And that really started everything. You know, and I just started playing the piano. That's great. And, and you've done so much extraordinary work since then. Since we're obviously going to jump around a little bit to various um, compositions, I guess the first one we're going, we wanted to talk about a little bit is, is one of your most recent. It's an opera, right? And it's, uh, it's called Blue, and it's something that you did last, about a year ago. Is that correct? Um, the premiere... Um, the premiere was a year ago. We did it at the Glinderglass Festival and yeah. we were three hours away from the dress rehearsal at the Kennedy Center at the Washington National Opera when it was called. I wrote right. it with uh, Taswell Thompson, who is a, a librettist who I love very, awesome. very much. And we did a series around the, the country, something called Breaking Glass, where we were looking, um, we were looking at the way that opera might, you know, might open up to the experience of what's on stage, that the lived experience of opera might reflect the lived experience of, of the, the American people. Yeah. And as we can see from this time, America has, a, a, we have a lot of work to do to make up for hundreds and hundreds of, of years of repression, injustice, ignorance, all of those things, but also to represent different kinds of stories, to put people in front of the camera, behind the camera, around the camera, and um, Taswell uh, wrote this beautiful libretto. We did it at Glimmer Glass, um, and we're still editing this. And we went around the country, and one of those places was National Sawdust, run by um, Elena Park, who I love. And uh, so I, uh, Brianna Hunter and I did a very informal concert, uh, just me at the piano in a very, very ill-conceived um, jumpsuit. And Brianna Hunter plays the mother in this opera, which is about a black family in Harlem and their newborn son that then turns into a teenage son who gets politicized and then um, suffers the injustice of police criminality on, not brought to the stage. Um, and and it was, it's, it's a very joyful opera. It's a, it's a very, I think a very difficult opera to watch and to be in. And um, I, I really am proud of it. Great. So, so we set up the um, the little piece that we're going to see from it. This is a piece called um, "Go Figure." It is a, a part of a section of, of Act One where the mother is um, the girlfriends come in, and I used to do this all the time when when uh, I I don't people know this about me. I don't tell. I'm not on social media. I don't tell people, and they're like, I noticed that you got like you're the queen of a country right now were you going to tell us and i just i was taught to keep things so close to the chest and um and she is pregnant and she has gotten married and she has married a cop um, an officer of the law as he says and uh she, her girlfriends come in they can't believe it and she's explaining the depth and the joy and the fear of of this man who makes her uh, so happy and her fear about the job that he does as an African-American man in, in the police force. Great, so if we're ready, I guess we'll hit our stop video and then we can, Claire can set this up.
That's fantastic. Yeah, she's incredible. I love her so much. We have this cast, we have just been through it together. You know, I, it's, it's, it's a real, it's, you know, we sometimes we talk about, not sometimes, but we talk about privilege. And then there's the privilege of being uh, involved in a project like that with a, a cast like, like this and, and the cost of doing work like this. And uh, you know, it's 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 sort of beyond description what that's yeah. been like. And is it? And and you said that you you were at the Kennedy Center and and you had to sort of stop as everything was shutting down. Does that mean will it be re-upped? Will we look forward yeah. to being able to see it again? And do, is there a plan afoot for when that might be, or we don't know yet? Uh, it, there 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 is a plan. I believe it's. Um, I don't know if it's been announced, but there is a plan for it to uh, be in at the WNO, the Kennedy Center, and there are other programs uh, that that uh, Cheska Zambello, who is a great friend of mine, um, to do it there and in other ways. It's going to be in Toledo. It was scheduled for Chicago. And uh, uh, they're still, you know, with all of the moving pieces, you know this all too well, we're not exactly, exactly sure. Yeah, yeah, well, it looks just extraordinary and I can't wait to see it. And, and once, well, it's probably not a small thought, but Avi, you're somebody who's written operas, you've written musicals, you've written for film. Do you want to talk a little bit about what, how, what you feel are the sort of significant differences between 
writing for that? Because actually, we're, we're, I make sure that I make no money from all of it. That's just that has to be Neil. That's where I am. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I'm right there with you. Uh, but what you were saying before about the idea of this opera kind of, you know, approaching this in a different way, and in some ways, I, I would think you'd be very well suited to that because you've dealt in, for lack of a better term, sort of real realism or realistic musical theater. And so talk a little bit about the opera, the difference between opera and music goals in your mind. You know, I, it's such a really, it's a, it's a good question because I think sometimes when we say opera, it's how I feel. Uh, I spent a summer at the Aspen Music Festival. I, I wrote there um, under the um, teaching of George Tintakis. And I learned a lot there, but mostly what I learned is how stupid I felt a lot of the time around classical musicians. And I was raised as one and trained as one. And I feel that there is a, a sort of scurrying to separate always in music. You do this and you don't do that and you shouldn't do that. And I am I'm sick of that idea. And one thing in these months that I just feel is like make work, it's hard to make work. If the tessitura is large and they sing through, maybe you'll call it opera. If you're using a large, who knows what it is? Call it an anchovy pie, but make the work and go see the work and support the work. And sometimes I feel like the naming of the work, which is, you know, sonatas weren't, nothing's named until after it's made. You make the work and then you call it something. And we've been doing a lot of work about, you know, stretching these things to their growing edge so that the opera and the musical, where does one begin and one end, perhaps if there is a way that they should be interconnected so that yeah. those labels are being thrashed about and redefined. You can, you can really call it whatever you want. You know, the threshold of when you go see something is very important. And as Sontheim says, if you go to an opera house, it's an opera. I think there's something in that, you know, the range in the classical voice is, is very different. The use of amplification is not assured. It's very different. Uh, these opera singers, I, I say it to them, they're like the NFL. You know, you, you could just, you could drive a Jeep over their diaphragm. It is incredible, the training. And these YAs, the young artists, they're actors and they can, they can do a cartwheel around the stage and sing a high E. I mean, they're incredible. And it's how I feel about the best of musical theater. And I love these invisible stories that suddenly you put DFC, you know, down in center. And, and so that idea of what can one thing, how, how much can you press a musical theater into that form? How can you press opera, um, put your, your stamp on it? And entertainment to me is what's compelling. Yeah. And what people, what holds people interested. And that is hard to do. You know, I've done a lot of work where people kick the chairs in front of them and, and, and some work where, you know, it is really hit a chord. So I know, I know both um, stage, but I do love working in, in an epic way. And that's what, for me, opera asks is to really, the tessitura, which means the range, to go all the way up, the proscenium getting high and all the way down. And I love that challenge. And when that's I say love, I'm terrified of it and I'm crippled by self-doubt, but. Yeah, well, I, I don't think you're alone. I think so many great artists have that, but that's, yeah, that, that is amazing. And, and you've been such a sort of groundbreaker in pushing the envelope and, and not for nothing, right? You and Lisa Crone were the first female writing team to win a Tony for best original score for Fun Home. Um, yeah. Thank God. And, and um, can you talk about what that meant to you? I mean, obviously you've worked so hard and done such incredible work and put in such a lot of time, but to, what that meant to you and, and and then maybe we'll get into obviously the piece and we're going to hear something from that piece too but but that moment because we are in this time of change and hopefully breaking down lots of barriers that shouldn't be there and but specifically that moment for you was that a big turning point well the uh, yes uh, it, it it was a big turning point for me partially because i um i've been I've had the good grace and fortune to work with great playwrights, David Lindsay Abair, Lisa Crone, Tony Kushner, Brian Crawley, Dick Scanlon, Taswell Thompson. 
and um, David Henry Huang and the, the ideas that uh, they bring something to this incredible tennis game is so uh, fantastic for me. And working with Lisa Crone and her lived experience as a queer woman growing up at the same time that I grew up and what happens when you push down adolescence and you're not allowed to have it. Well, the math of repression just goes, it, it, it comes back thousandfold. And so being, hearing her story and me bringing, you know, it, it almost goes to a third rail. And that moment where we won the Tony was, I, I felt very grateful and angry that it got so much attention as the first females because it is slightly, uh, it's a little hard for me sometimes when I'm called the most prolific female because that doesn't actually feel like a compliment in this way that I, I believe that one might write about it. Yeah. I, I am a composer and uh, I, I have done so much work because I feel like I'm always catching up and also to honor the legacy of my grandfather who died pumping gas. And, and, and so for me, it's that idea. And uh, I, I feel like my point of view when I wrote Fun Home, I wrote it as a daughter. Yeah. And there are very few daughter father stories and and so it's really important that when we have that pov we have a point of view that we're looking at the world through our prism that that's what's really important that that's when we talk about representation it's from where you write from where you are yeah so i think that to me felt really it's it was redeeming and gratifying all those things and still and yet the fact that it it has called attention is it's both things it's a blend for me yeah no and hopefully things will continue to change for the better it von home was such an amazing piece and i i didn't see it downtown but i saw it at circle in the square and it just blew me away um we're going to we're going to see a a a, a short selection from that right now. Do you want to set this up a, a little bit? I guess this is from the Tonys, yeah? This is from the Tonys. When we, um, when we were going uh, uptown and Sam Gold, our, our director, uh, who again, I, I, I learned so much. These be people become your teachers. Um, George C. Wolfe, Sam Gold, these, um, Michael Mayer. And we were, um, when we announced that we were going into the round, I thought, how do you do a musical in the round? I mean, it's hard enough when you don't do it in the round. I mean, why don't we just go to the beach and do it there? Like, Ugh. And, and he said something so among many amazing things. He said, we're gonna go to the round and we're actually gonna get smaller. And I'd never heard that because you go to Broadway, it's like, you get bigger, everything's bigger. Yeah. The concessions are bigger. The slippery things are bigger. Yeah. Big, big things of junior mints. But he was like, we're going to get smaller and no one is going to be more than 10 rows away. And that was intriguing. And he talked about the way that memory works and the way that memory is inconvenient. And, you know, it just gets you here and here and here. And that got me really excited. And one, one, is one of many seven dozen emails I sent in my anxiety about how it was going to possibly work. And when we were um, doing the Tonys, we all decided at the same time that it was gonna be Ring of Keys, which again is smaller. And he knew the way that the camera might meet this extraordinary actor named Sidney Lucas um, singing Ring of Keys. And, and Sam directed this part of the Tonys and worked with the camera. And I, he just did such a beautiful job. And I haven't watched, I watched, I watched a little bit of the clip when, when we were all sound checking and it was like, you know, my face almost melted off. Well, great. So let's, um, let's see it. Let's set it up. In this panel, me and my dad in a diner. Where's Betty? She went home. Lorna's on now. Caption. My dad and I both grew up in the same small Pennsylvania town. Oh. And I didn't know it, but both of us were gay. Where's your barrette? And we were exactly alike. Put it back in. Keeps the hair out of your eyes. So what a crew cut. And we were nothing alike. Do not take it out again. Which was it, Dad? Get Lorna. Need coffee.
You didn't notice her at first, Dad, but I did. I saw her the minute she walked in. I'd never seen a woman who looked like her. It was like I was a, a traveler in a foreign country who runs into someone from home. Someone they've never met before, but somehow just recognizes. No one just came in the door Like no one I ever saw before I feel... I feel... I don't know where you came from I wish I did I feel so dumb I feel... Your swagger you're bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing Your short hair and your dungarees and your lace-up boots And your keys, oh, your ring of keys I thought it was supposed to be you seem okay with being strong, I want. You're so... It's probably conceited to say, but I think we're alike in a certain way. I... Um, your swagger and your bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing, your short hair Your keys, oh, your ring of keys. Do you feel my heart saying hi? In this whole luncheonette, why am I the only one who sees your No, I mean, handsome. Your swagger and your bearing and the just right clothes you're wearing. Your short hair and your dungarees and your lace-up boots. And your keys, oh, your ring. Wow, that brings back so many great memories. And, and it's true, you know, you were talking about Circle in the Square, which you don't think about that much, but it is, there is an intimacy, you know, you think of it as Broadway, but the fact that you are so close and uh, I think really is incredible. And there's something about that thrust, you know, putting people on an X and all of that, that you feel just so involved. But what an incredible piece, what an amazing, amazing piece. Um, I know we're, we're going to, I'd like to start, we're, we're going to get into what's coming up next for you, the, the revival of Carolina Change. And I wanted to um, talk about, because you've had a long relationship with Tony Kushner and a long collaboration with Tony Kushner. And I know it's been both, you've done music for pl his plays and, and I guess, is Carolina Change considered a, it's a sung through? Is it, I don't know what the hell it is. Yeah. I love it. I don't know what it is. It I mean, I've heard it. It's like a folk opera. It's a, yeah, yeah. I don't know. But I don't know. It, about, you know. Tell, yeah, tell me about because, like you were saying before, you've you've had the great fortune of working with such amazing writers. But talk about your relationship with Tony and how that worked and and informed your work and what that's been like that collaboration. Uh, when I started working with Tony, that was for me the beginning of thinking of myself differently about what was possible for, for me. It, I, I started thinking about musicals really differently. Caroline was, a, was, I mean, he always tells this, but when he sent me Caroline, I said no, because it was, it felt like it was a complete work. It was very different 
the ideas were the same, but it was single spaced. And I thought, this is a play. There's no room. There's no place to park your musical car in here. And I wasn't, I, I just, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I said no, which he's punished me for. And, and then we were doing something else. And we, he said, will you take a look at this? Let's look at it together. And at that point, I understood what he, that Tony rewrites and everything is an oil paint for him. I mean, we know that he's just, nothing is locked. Right. And uh, so we started working and that's when I realized how content really can make the form. We just started writing and something like I hate the bus was four lines. And that's when I would say, oh, why don't we, why don't we, and then we just started working on it as almost a mosaic. And um, and then we we that that piece brought me it just it, you know it was really a redefining moment working with George Siebel and uh, then we did Mother Courage together I I scored the documentary that was about him that's really quite quite beautiful we just did West Side Story together he did the screenplay I was the local producer we wrote an opera together that is going to be um, that was also done at Glimmerglass and we'll have an act to it at a certain point and. Right. I love working with him. He has a real, he's, you know, when I first started working with him and my daughter was, I think, a year old, and he would be saying, like, I, I went to the library of sociology today, and I thought, and I had just jet jelly all over my shirt, and I thought, you what? <laughs> okay, well, my, my daughter spit up once on me today. Let me try to, you know, but he, he brings this, he has this intellect, and he also has a funny bone. And those two things are rare, and they're so great. He's he's a lot of fun to work with. I mean, he because he's he's also a master debater, so sometimes I just have to really think through my answers <laughs> because he sounds right all the time. And and talk of, obviously we're in this, you know, for lack of a better word, revolutionary revolutionary moment right now, and. What about that and Caroline? Does it feel like, like the fact that you're about to do it now? What does that feel like? You know, con context is everything. When we first did did this piece, it was 2002. Um, we were on Broadway in 2004. And that was, you know, just think about what that was before. Yeah. When it was done in Chicago, we sat with Obama's campaign staff when it was done after, um, after Broadway, when you talk about taking down a Confederate soldier and they, they are now meeting in Lake Charles about taking down the soldier at, in Lake, that soldier that we talk about in the musical, it's really based on, yeah. um, on, on Tony's semi-autobiographical. Semi so it, it just, you, you can't uh, hear it any other way because there's a, there is a, an experience to these headlines that it brings onto the stage. And you think about Emmy, Caroline's daughter, Caroline is a maid and she's working for $30 a week. And Emmy is like and the Angela Davis. I mean, she is, she is about burning down the house and, and about looking at something and, and honoring her roots in a way she shares that with Allison. When Allison says about her father, I'm nothing like my father, I'm completely like my father. Of course, both are true. You have to, in one way, betray your parents sometimes in order to move the national story or the global story forward. Yeah. And, and that's what they're, I think both of them did that. They took this heartache and, and trying to figure out their relationship to a mother and a father, realizing what wasn't in the time possible for them and taking that and using it as jet fuel. So yeah. I'll never think of Emmy in a, in a, in another way after all of this time, especially during this these these months, these past months. Yeah, and this is now would knock wood. This is now going to come back next at the end of this season. We're hoping to to when, when is what are the new dates for it? Uh, I I believe I'm not sure the exact dates because yeah. they keep. As they soon as possible. Shifting, but it will, I, I, I think we feel very confident. I feel really confident and, and, and Todd has been really great with everybody about when, when the roundabout comes back, it will be the first show. I, I feel like that's, that um, seems to be the, the, um, what, they, what they really are banking on. 
Yeah, so exciting. And, and, and so we're going to hear a selection from that. And do you want to introduce, we have a very special guest. We have um, a really special guest. This is um, Sammy Williams. Is, uh, she is playing Emmy in the revival. Sammy and I met, this is a sort of crazy story. Um, uh, we met because I, with Darren Biggert and Toria Beard, who are two producers and directors I, I work with a lot, we, we started doing A Broader Way, which is also a program. If anybody wants to check it out, please do. And uh, we, we were artists in residence at Pace and Sammy came in, we were doing a kind of version of Caroline with the students and Sammy came in as a freshman and we cast her as Caroline. So I think she's the only person I know who has played both Caroline and now Emmy. But the, the great thing about it was Sammy, who I really believe in, I believe in this young person, I believe in her skill and her determination, um, but she's, um, she brought in Caroline's point of view when she was doing Emmy, which is the, the, stra most, the strangest way to, to do this role. Usually you have people who do that like in True West and they, they do yeah. both roles, but not right. generational like this. And so it was, it's been really a joy to watch her process and, and talk about this character. And she is going to join us and do um, yeah, the Amy, epilogue. Now and then we'll set it up. There she Hi, is. Amy. Hi. Great. So, so as this, getting ready, yeah, go, go, Jenny. Um, so uh, Sam is going to do the um, the epilogue from Carolina or Change, which Emmy, at the very end, you find out that someone uh, all, through all of the the musical and Sammy, if I miss anything, can you um, just jump in? You you're you, it's talk, it's talked about this crime and it was a crime that um, the 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 soldier was uh, came down. And someone did it, and and the, the, the Lake Charles is just you know outraged and uh, really on fire be, because of this. This is a this is a high crime, and um, at the very end, she'll she'll say you'll hear her say just one last thing, mm -hmm. and that came about because um, Tony always said you know in, in Shakespeare it's there's always there's often a moment where the people you know they they were heading toward the barn, and he'll say just one more thing before yeah. you go. And then, you know, it, it relaxes the audience to say like, oh, right, this is the last piece of the puzzle. Great, so if, are you ready, Sammy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So we'll turn off all the video and you can go for it. There and that statue fell. Who knows where they put his head? That old statue nightmare man. Who can say what happened that night at the courthouse? I can. I was there that night. I saw. I watched it topple like a tree. We were scared to death to break.
before. You are That's a treasure. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. So great. Beautiful. Such beautiful work. Yeah. Um, before we, and we're going to take some questions in just a sec. Before we do that, um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, Janine, is you're involved with Encores, right? Or you have been. Yeah. Um, I have been. Yeah, you have been. And, um, and it's described because it was sort of a new thing that you did there, right? When you got involved with the, was it sort of, what do they call it? Off broader or off, set, off center? I, I can't off remember. center. Yeah, off it was center. called Encores Off Center in, I don't, I don't know, 2015, maybe? Yeah. I know it was before then. Uh, uh, Jack and um, Arlene, Arlene Schuler, and they called and said, we want to do a new program that's an offshoot of Encores. We don't know what to call it. And um, we would want, we want to know if you want to produce it. And I was so happy about that because I started what I was, I started as a music director and arranger and, and pit pianist, but I also started producing in Nashville when I was 24. So I've spent thousands of hours in the recording studio uh, because I was mentored by someone who was mentored by Elliot Carter, but also was a Nashville producer. And he, and he had a love of world music and church music and gospel. And I just learned everything from him. Um, wait, so what we were talking about. So basically when you got into <laughs> oh, right on course. Yeah, yeah on course. Like how it came about. Yeah. And, and why, yeah, and so what was different called, about it? Because it was sort of different what you did. Yeah. It was yeah. basically, we wanted to take um, smaller shows and um, and celebrate the big idea. And I had been raised on on shows. And when I finally got into theater, and I didn't get into it until I was 18, you know, Runaways and the Me Nobody Knows and Cradle Will Rock and yeah. um, and uh, you know all these incredible sh off Broadway shows that the, the public the Trod Rundgren show. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, there was something that I'm forgetting. But a lot of, you know, the the uh, shows about social injustice and yeah. they were just really courageous, smaller shows and they gave me a platform and we did a lot of work and it's being continued now. Um, Michael Friedman took it un until he died and then um, Annie Kaufman is doing it right now. Yes. And it turned into, we, we had an ar artist board and lobby projects and we just filled the space with ideas and it was interesting Sam Gold did the uh, Cradleville Rock was the first show and I remember thinking I wonder if this is going to work my stomach hurts and it turns out that if you have an idea that can hold the space then the space holds and that was a great lesson from it. Yeah and so nice like I, I had I remember when I was in high school we were sort of all obsessed with with Runaways and, and then seeing that again the fact that you put that up it was just it, it's such an exciting thing to have a platform for stuff that wouldn't normally be given a second or, you know, hopefully will be given lots of second chances, but hadn't been. And that, that was such an exciting thing for me. And I think an exciting thing for the city. So it's great that that's, that's all happening. Um, I think we're right around question time. Um, and I think Annie or Claire is going to tell us if we have some questions. And if we don't, I'll keep asking questions. Do you guys have yes. some questions? We've great. got some great ones, yeah. Uh, so Janine, the first one is, what elements are essential for you in creating a successful collaboration with a lyricist? Oh, that's a good question. The reason I'm hesitating is every lyricist I have worked with, every person is so different. So I would, I would, I guess it's the, the um, number one would be the incredible curiosity. And number two is I, I need to work with people who aren't precious about their work, that they can cut easily. And cutting something is, it, it, it takes practice. It's, it can be really painful, but um, it, this is where the Sicilian rage really helps because when, when something, and Neil knows this because we're working together, it, when something doesn't work, I turn on it. I get very Michael Carleone about it. I'm like, that song doesn't work. It's got to go. It's like Fredo. It's got to go out to the rowboat. But I'm so half Italian, really, so I can relate to it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, that is really important. Like a good sense of humor, 
a, a way that we can debate and not to take it personally. Because as you can see, I like to, you know, I think that's really important. And the, the last thing is the person who has the strong impulse has to be able to follow what they think. Even if it leads you down to a cul-de-sac, it will lead you maybe somewhere else that you wouldn't have gone if you hadn't followed that idea. So the person with a strong impulse gets to follow through on that no matter what. I should make a brochure. There, there, there you go. <laughs> awesome. So here's an, a really hard one for you. But um, what is your process for dancing with the self-doubt? Oh my God, I thought you were gonna say for dancing. And I was like, well, first I do a plie. <laughs> and I make when sure I was I reading it, I thought it was gonna be talking about your dancing career, but okay, no. I was a dance minor at Barnard and I was terrible. So that's really important to know. <laughs> Process and self-doubt. So here's what I have learned, cause I am rather old. I mean, I'm 58, so I've been doing this for 40 years. I keep thinking that doubt is going to go away. And this is where working with someone like George Sewell is so wonderful. And when I was doing Caroline, I was such a mess. And I called George and I expected George to say, oh, act one is so good. Oh my God, he's going to redefine musical theater. And what George said was, oh, act one is a mess. And I thought, oh, no, no. This is where you tell me that I have talent. And this is where you tell me everything's going to be okay. He's like, well, why would I do that? You know you have talent. I don't know if it's gonna be okay, it's a mess, but it's worth pursuing and we must do it. And I thought, uh, right. So the innocent of what's to, you're innocent like a character on stage. You don't know what's gonna happen. And I don't expect to not doubt myself anymore. I just know that that's gonna be, like I never expect anything to go well. BFF, braced for failure. It's just in my nature. Um, and then if it goes well, I am so, grateful and surprised and it just it's it's never it, it it hasn't been anything else but that i've never in my life a day felt like you know what is really going well my writing i just don't feel that i don't you know so i guess it's sort of like the bargaining acceptance denial i i don't know you know maybe it's that that part of just being understanding that it's going to accompany me it's like you know a bad date to an awards show Hey, Janine, I can, I, can I add something to that question, which is, do you gravitate towards things that scare you? Everything. I mean, when you're looking at a piece and thinking, oh, oh yeah. should I do that or not, if it scares you, is that a plus? That, that, in other words, the idea like that fear sometimes becomes a motor to go, oh, it scares me. Maybe that's some, Maybe I should go toward that. Is that. Does that happen with you? Every, I think it's actually a location for me. Yeah. If, it, the invisible story, if I've never seen something like that, I want to write it. If I feel like I need to know more about that, I will write it because then you sort of, you become a student of it. And you're, you're absolutely right though, Neil, that's a great question. And I think you just have to traffic in those, with those characters and with those people to know more about the, the world. Yeah. So yeah, I would say yes. So having given you a big one, I'll give you a technical one. Um, do you, flat. yeah, I know it's, there you go. That's like a kind <laughs> you got of it. medical right musical answer. Tourette's uh, D minor. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Am I a bad guest? Neil, am I a bad no, guest? No, you're perfect. You're, <laughs> we want to, we could go on and on forever. Um, do you prefer to orchestrate your own work? And secondly, can you speak to the power of instrumentation versus piano? Oh my God. That is a great question. So I have, um, again, my mentor, Burl Red, who I studied with and met at 24, he, I used to drive him crazy because he would say, you're making pause music. And I'm like, pause music? What, what's pause music? He's like, you know, when you just make music wherever your paws go. And, and he's like, the piano is not a piano. The piano is, I don't know why he suddenly has become Boston. He was from Arkansas. He was like, the piano is a representation of the orchestra. The piano is a means to an end. So when you play something, you have to hear something else unless you're writing for the piano. So it's why sometimes when you're in rehearsal, you play a lot of motion on the piano because the piano dies away. Well, a string can play for a week and a half and, 
and it will keep going because they bow that instrument. It's not percussive. And so, and you can't pedal an orchestra. You have to make sure that something sustains. So when I write now, I have to know what the combination is. Are you writing for rhythm? And then you know what would play it. If you're writing for an, an orchestra of 46, you understand that there's, there's a certain amount of color that you can get from there. So the piano arrangement is what it's going to be. And, and, and it has to satisfy the rehearsal requirements. And so I find myself saying a lot, that note's gonna go away, but you'll see it will last or ask the pianist to keep playing it. So um, that's the international sign for tremolo and something else. Uh, that, that, that sound is gonna keep going so that it's not the be all and end all. Great, thank you. Um, so you work with so many different collaborators and write about characters that don't share your identities um, in many of your shows. How do you honor the authenticity and integrity of those characters you're writing in the stories of those communities while staying true to your own artistic sensibility? Oh my God, where'd you get these questions from? I know, there's like, some, and by the way, there, there's so many incredible ones to choose from, but God. yeah, big questions. Um, all right, well, one of the things that I do a lot, um, I interview the people I'm working with. I talk to a lot of people. Also, I have a very diverse group of friends who I've been friends with a really long time. And um, so I, it's just part of, part of my life. But Taswell and I, like I spoke to Taswell about his life to the point where it was, you know, I just felt like that's what you have to do. You have the responsibility um, to really understand something. You're still a visitor to that life. You're a dramatic visitor. You're never, and you never, never to pretend that that's been your experience. But it's like you go, you ask and you ask and you ask and you read on the sides. You do labor on your own to understand the context what the police force was like, what that was like, what those, the, that era would be. Alison Bechtel gave me her journals. I read all about her. I understood. I would talk to Lisa again and again and again. Um, Fun Home was very much a reflection of my relationship with my father in the soup. But with, with Lisa, I would say like, well, what would, what would, and she would, these stories would come out. And, and so that's, that's part of the oral tradition that I think like the Zora Neale Hurston tradition of going into a community and say, tell me your story. Don't write it down, just tell me. You don't have to, we don't have to be about the written word. Just let me listen to how you have lived, what you have lived, what, what you care about, you know, all of those things. That's the great joy of it. Thank you. Um, so I think this may be our last one. How do you organize your composing schedule? Do you sit down for defined blocks of time? Do you just like get up in the middle of the night? Is it different every day, every project. I know <laughs> Janine has left the building. I'm like, stop video. <laughs> so here's the thing about me. If I don't have a deadline, I don't do work. If I don't have a deadline, I, I, really, I eat small snack sized Butterfingers and I never leave my room because I remember the doubt that we were talking about, like I work really hard, I work a lot, but if I don't, and my incredible um, partner in crime, Christopher Anselmo, who's a wonderful composer, he, uh, I, he works with me and we, we keep a schedule and he's like, we have to do, because I just have to have that. I find it terrifying to, you know, the blank page is just really, really terrifying thing for me. So it's very easy to just do, oh, I'm gonna sit on a panel, I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna do anything. I don't wanna write. And I also make sure that I go, like right now I'm at a place called Breezy Shores and there's a family that's very close to me, the Barons, Ron and Judy and Megan Barron. I'm here with my daughter and Darren Biggert. There's a community here of artists and they're the spirit of this place. I have written almost every show at, at this place on Long Island, at least big chunks of it. And so I come back here and I remember what it was like. It was like, that's right, you were terrified then, you're terrified now. So what I try to do is I now make deadlines and impose them. When Cheska asked me to do blue, I asked her to give me 
micro deadlines. And I said, let's just set up once a month this thing so that I come to the, your living room and I play stuff for you. Otherwise it won't, I have to break it down. And, and we did that. And then slowly you start getting traction because there's no greater joy for me than when you are third of the way through. When you're a third of the way through, the piece starts saying to you, it's, it's like a child, you know, when, you're, when your baby grows up suddenly and emphatically, they start saying things like, no, or I want that one. And until that, there's a lot of guesswork. And I think it's the same with the piece that it eventually starts saying what it wants. And it's so much easier and it's still hard, but it's not like going from nothing. You can hear the way the characters sing and, um, and use theme and variation. Well, you don't have a theme. There's nothing to vary it with. I think there's an appetite for one more question. So this is a um, encore. So, uh, a lot of questions have been about soft power. So could you just tell oh, us? Right. Yeah, I, you have so many, it's yeah. hard to choose, yeah. but if you could just um, tell us a little bit about soft power, whatever you want, that'd be awesome. Tell us a little bit about, about. The question was just generally, will you talk about the process of soft power? And there were a lot of fans of that show in the audience. Oh, I'm so, I'm so glad about that. That was a really, uh, you know, soft power came out of David Henry Huang's imagination because of his, uh, he, he, he had great love for the revival of The King and I, and he was mad at it. And it was this incredible blend. He was so in love with the artistry and the production, and he was so mad at the politics of it. Uh, and the, the sort of irresponsibility that met its beauty and the ambition of it. And, and what it was saying, but it's, it's a white savior piece at the end of the day, that's what it is. And he wanted to turn the trope. And we had a really fun time uh, doing that. And again, I talked to him a lot about what it's like to be the only man of color when you're pitching and the way that Chinese executives are always asking him to do work and what that's like. And, you know, when, when we, um, when he first wrote it, there was an assumption that it was going to be Madam President. And then we got to the reading and we all had our, I voted, I voted. And the next morning he started rewriting the show at, from, from page one. He just turned it around and became very much about, about something else. But uh, I, I, the, the, the entire cast was Asian American, except for um, the woman who played Hillary Clinton. And when we gathered, together and checked in because again there's cost to that kind of work there was great joy you really hear what their experiences in musical theater have been as an as the asian american community and i it's just you know i didn't know and now i know and uh that was a, again it was a real privilege of being in that room and and at a great cost to them bringing a lot of great joy but also great heartache and trauma about their their experiences in our industry. Thanks so much. I'll turn it over to Neil and um, Claire to wrap up. Yeah, and I'll just say, it's really amazing to hear you talk on so many levels, but I just, talking about soft power, that you've done such a, a vast amount of, of work and incredible work. Like each, as I'm hearing you talk about, each show stands on its own and on its own terms. So it's it's just a pleasure to hear you talk about your work, mm -hmm. about your process, and um, and thanks for, you know, being part of this and allowing us to talk to you today. First of all, it has been a, a great pleasure. As you know, I'm a huge fan of this of your theater. I've seen almost everything, um, and I also want to give a shout out to the people behind these the scenes who made this happen so smoothly. It takes a lot of work to make one of these um, an hour like this. And so I wanna, wanna say thank you to everybody. Text yesterday and, and do this. This takes hours and hours and hours of work and preparation. And also to Christopher Anselmo who, who, um, who helped as well. Yeah. Thank you. And if it's okay, I'd love to bring Sammy back in to just say thank you for that um, extraordinary performance. Sammy, if you're able to come join us on screen, you um, are an absolute exquisite talent. I just want to say for the audience too, doing that live is not simple. The things that you often see on screen like this are pre-recorded. That was not. And um, I, 
I had chills. I miss being in the room with people and watching work like that. So Janine, for that beautiful music, thank you. And Samantha, thank you so much for um, allowing us to just bask in that talent. I'm so honored. Well, yeah. Thank you, thank you all. And, um, and Claire, do we have anything else to cover before we say goodbye? That was my little daughter, Julia. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Juju. <laughs> oh my God! It's the I best do, thing do. about these are the drive-bys. She's excited so... to be part of this. She's um, the God, best. Yeah. Again, um, thank you all. Thank you, Claire, yeah. and um, thank you to everybody on these Fridays for tuning in. I know it's a strange world right now, and these always give me a, a little bit of hope and light. And talking to yeah. extraordinary people like this is just amazing. Yeah. So, so thank you all, and. Yeah. There anything also, follow Sammy on Instagram because she's. Yeah. You, say, Sammy, just say a real quick thing about the things that you're doing, especially with Kayla. Oh, yeah. I'm doing a, um, a kind of a fundraiser for, a, uh, for my high school tomorrow. Um, and it's to raise money for a scholarship uh, to go to a black student um, in the theater um, community there. And yeah, we're going to do a live stream of that. So make sure you tune in. That's yeah. awesome. We'll, we'll, um, I'll connect with you. We'll put that in our post show follow up that audiences get. So if you guys want to tune in and learn a little bit more, we hope that you will. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and spending this time with us. Um, uh, like Neil said, it's the highlight of our week. Um, we love our artists. So um, we're so grateful. And if you've been moved, we've put um, a link to donate to Atlantic. A gift of any size would be so appreciated as we barrel towards the end of our fiscal year at the end of the month on August 31st. Um, and be well, take care of each other and yourselves and we'll see you very soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Go. you. Bye everyone.